Okay, official good afternoon. Uh, my name is Arjuna Manamperi, Chairman of the Mechanical Engineering Sectional Committee of Institution of Engineers, Sri Lanka. Welcome you all. Uh, I saw quite a few uh, online registrations. I'm looking at the audience which, uh, by the way, greetings to anybody who's online. Uh, we live stream all these lectures throughout the world. Uh, ISL has about 15,000 members uh, currently and they could uh, see any of these activities live and then we always record these lectures digitally. We archive them and you can, if you are a member of IESL, you can go to www.iesl.lk and go to resources under public lectures, you can view any of these lectures. That is provided that you are a member. Gentlemen, I would uh, encourage you to come to the front please. The two gentlemen who were just walking. Uh, we normally start these sessions on time because one of the things that Sri Lanka needs to still understand, uh, which never seems to be the case, is to be on time. So we start these lectures on at 5.15, which is five minutes before, and people will start trickling in. Some will be watching online, and others will watch later. Because you have to understand, as engineers, we work everywhere in the world, including Sri Lanka, so there are people watching from Mahargama, Mahayangana, uh, Anuradhapura, Jaffna, Bati, and all those places. Today's lecture by a well-known person, uh, I generally do not read a litany of things about a lecturer because this information is already online. The reason you are here is because you know the lecturer or the content matters to you. Dr. Travis Ferreira is our lecturer today. Anyone who has taken MBA uh, in Sri Lanka probably should have gone through his lectures one day or another. He has been around for a long time. Still young, that doesn't mean he's old, but he's wiser. Young, but wiser. <laughs> right, young, but wiser. Today's topic, uh, he, he will elaborate on this uh, concept. Uh, the reason why we thought that this is a very appropriate one, and I really would like uh, uh, those of you uh, who have uh, young engineering friends to inform them to at least watch this again digitally, uh, in the digital archives, because this is a very important one. The word effectiveness is the key thing. We were just discussing with Dr. Travis. I think we are a very intelligent group of people in Sri Lanka. There is no question in my mind that as human beings, we are very intelligent. There is no question about that. You are born with plenty of intelligence. Institution of Engineers is essentially a place where a lot of intelligent people gather, actually. There is no question in our mind. There is nothing to be questioned about our intelligence. But how we gather knowledge with your intelligence and then how you transform that into wisdom. You know, your intelligence is you are born with intelligence then you have to gather knowledge through books, through classes, living life from others. But still not enough, then you have to convert that into wisdom. Effectiveness for me personally is all about having that wisdom or that wise, that, that knowing what to do and when to do. Because having the intelligence and even having the knowledge is not enough to be effective in my book. So therefore, let's listen to our lecturer, Dr. Travis Pereira. Uh, from PIM, Postgraduate Institution Management. Uh, everybody knows where it is around Borella, the big big building, right? So, without any further ado, sir, I welcome you to the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. So good evening, lady and gentlemen. One lady, so many gentlemen. Right. Uh, I think uh, Arjuna told you a little bit about me, but something very interesting that I'm an engineer as well. I'm a mechanical designs engineer. A long time ago, actually, I did engineering, then transitioned into more into the area of uh, business development, and I was a general manager as well at, in a company, and then thought of doing the PhD. So. Uh, PhD was uh, uh, quite different from engineering, it was uh, organizational behavior and that's my specialty today. Uh, leadership uh, which is applied organizational behavior and uh, business development itself, entrepreneurship particularly, they are all areas which are very important. 
so this topic i think is uh, will be very useful for all of us uh, because uh, something that is very very particular to sri lankans is that we are all intelligent guys right i think so and i i show you look agree with that but there are no systems sometimes to bring out our intelligence in a synergistic form sometimes and this is exactly what we talk about effectiveness effectiveness is actually getting there doing if you have a set of goals achieving it and uh, how you achieve it of course requires a little of efficiency as well that is how you use resources you know as engineers we all know that that input upon output upon input is very basically what efficiency is around but uh, you might not get there you might really say for example we want to go to candy and uh, we want to get there on time so we get there on time but sometimes we might uh, not drive efficiently right we might somehow get there our fuel consumption might not be that efficient but getting there is effectiveness getting there using the right resources is really using the resources well is uh, efficiency so uh, although we know these areas uh, there are other things there some of the very bodily kind of uh, things that might be very useful uh, and this is where we look at uh, what really helps us to become effective using more of bodily intelligence which is like creating habits creating habits it's a kind of a practice sometimes so this whole area is uh, very relevant uh, particularly for professional engineers or profession any professional for that matter is how to get there okay how would you be effective so here is my presentation and uh, i'm focusing on uh, something here which a uh, long time ago about uh, 2000 odd years ago uh, aristotle the famous uh, philosopher from greece uh, said this uh, very important statement we are what we repeatedly do excellence then is not an act but a habit it's talking about habits and the whole uh, science of habits is interesting to know and more than anything else a series of habits or a system of habits leads to a big goal just one habit may not lead to a goal so you might have to have a system of habits that leads to big goals and uh, it's a, it's a repetitive type of thing uh, you keep doing it and then suddenly you get programmed you get mentally programmed and a set of mental programming actually leads to this so it's very body intelligence i would say the body the mind and the body working together to create something that's uh, lasting uh, so, so everyone talks about uh, a thing called work ethic that you find that very successful people uh, in that sense very effective people really have what's known as a work ethic not ethics ethics of course is a area of moral behavior but an ethic means a kind of a set of practices that leads you to some kind of success so it's body intelligence body mental all connected up uh, and uh, a series of micro habits series of habits a system of habits actually leads to this uh, so called work ethic now the whole principle behind this is that we are we are what we are today and if you look at this uh, figure down there we talk about today we are able to do so many things because of our technical knowledge uh because of uh, interpersonal kind of skills how we work with others and also ability to think the conceptual type and this is our ability today but if you look at any one of us i mean for example uh, you you will try to say okay in 5 years time 10 years time into the future uh what would you be right if you look at that now uh, when i was an engineer i never thought i'll be doing this really seriously right because some thing that i want to do what really drove me was uh, i want to see the world a simple thing like that so i was looking for paths to do that and eventually it ended up here this a different path all road so really what happens is uh, we are talking about capability capability is something your potential you have so many things more to do and you need to do that now if you can really look at your talents particularly this word talent is used is a very organic thing something that's developed inside your kind of dna Uh, you might actually turn your turn your ability into something bigger now for example i was a mechanical designs engineer but i long before that i was I, i could do art as well so that was a talent so the talent converted into with the technical skill of engineering i found it very nice to designs 
right? Designs engineering, I was a mechanical designs engineer. So this is what it calls the future, the capability, your potential. Now how do you get there? Two important things are shown how you get there. On one side, you have a word called self-efficacy, that is the belief, the belief that you can get there, the belief that you can get there, the trust that in yourself that you can get there. So that is really what self-efficacy is about. But along the way, you have to create some milestones, some uh, differences in behavior patterns, uh, some uh, body intelligence along the way. And that's what habit is about. Habits are habitual behavior. Sometimes you see people getting up. Entrepreneurs get up very often. They are not laid back. I have never come across a laid back entrepreneur. They're full of energy. How to get so much of energy? These kind of things are interesting to know. But it's a, through a series of habits that they have got that. They have programmed their body and the mind together and eventually they let it off and now it is self-acting. So that's what habit does. If you, I mean, if you want to try out a simple habit, now drinking 600 milliliters of water in the morning is a very difficult thing, but they say it's a very good thing. Okay, so you start drinking it the first time you, some of you may be drinking it already, right? The first time you went to drink it, it's very difficult. Sometimes it even comes off, right? You will throw it out sometimes. But if you keep doing it daily, after a certain time, the body gets accustomed to it and it takes off. Now you're driving a car. When you started learning driving the car, you had to be very conscious about the wheel, about the pedals, everything. But after a time, you can have a nice conversation with someone on the left and drive the car. So that's because it's habit. Some body intelligence has taken over and it's uh, sending you there. So this whole idea about trying to trying to evolve your capability, which is a larger, this larger system, larger potential that you have, is a uh, First, mentally, mentally is self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is actually the belief that you can get there, the strong belief. And also, the other side is to program yourself, your body and your mind together. So this is what habits is about, really the nature of habits. Okay, uh, now I want to connect up this idea of uh, what habits do ultimately. Habits create what's known as a work ethic. A work ethic is a system of habits, really. A system of habits that leads to large outcomes. Now with a single habit, you might get an output. output. But over a period of time, the people around you benefit by that. Whoever they are, maybe your family, maybe your organization. Those are outcomes, longer term. And more than anything else, over a longer period of time, you have an impact. Impact on society. Now if you try to, we go back in history and look at what are these impacts. Take examples, for example, of the Great Pyramid. Okay, this was, today Egypt is not such a great country. But there was a time they were very strong. And there were strong people actually who did this thing. How did they get there? For example, if you look at uh, the Great Pyramid, for example, the base at the base is uh, 7,000 square meters, uh, 146 meters high. But you'll be surprised at that the base it's out by only 18 centimeters. How the hell did they do that? No theater lights. Nothing. And the only, no wheel. There were no pulleys. The only instrument they had was the lever. The lever. So they should, as you can see this figure down there, they ramped. They create a ramp that went right up and they keep kept on pushing the things into place. But even making these single stones was a marvel. Each one of the block of stones was 2.5 tons, a perfect cube, right? And there was no space. They said you couldn't even pass a paper through that. So these uh, instruments, I think you can imagine what really drove them to do that. So a lot of uh, sociologists have studied what went into this. Why were societies suddenly growing in a big way? I talk about Egypt. Why not talk about Sri Lanka, for example? Okay, Sri Lanka. We are hydraulic civilization. I think the IESL had documented this amazing valving system uh, in the Bisoko tour. Uh, how did this happen? I mean, it's amazing. The kind of mathematical knowledge and the hydraulic principles we had at that time. Uh, not that we have lost it, <laughs> right? But we had it long time ago. And it led to a civilization, growth of civilization. Both are parallel. You can you, difficult to say what led to what. Whether it was the intelligence and the mathematical knowledge, the engineering capabilities that were there at that time, 
with that preceded civilization or a kind of a net civilization growth also encourage this kind of very difficult to say because it's more like the chicken and egg type of situation but the whole as is amazing because as you know i think i don't have talked too much about the bisogo tour where basically the valve power regulating escape of water in 4th century bc so we have been uh, identifying that see in my entire life there was a time i really worked uh, at ulhiti i did the detailed mechanical works of the ulhiti uh, radial gates okay a long time ago right so during that time that's the time they discovered they discovered the flow of water that was going on 1 in 120 or something upwards amazing so they were wondering how the hell this happened right so the whole idea is later on they found as you know that's called the coriolis principle the spin of the earth creates a coriolis component and that coriolis component actually drives the water how did they know that okay is amazing so what i want to try to tell you is that there was a different uh, civilization at that time and uh, really what went through that so why i am talking about work ethic why i am talking about nation building because the elements of this by the sociologists and people like that have said it's due to the ethic that the people had the practices they had the way they looked at things and also these things were built on little little habits habits ways of doing things okay so we are going a little more into this and there are the sociologists actually uh, wrote about this these are the people who researched about habitual behavior for example max weber long time ago he tried to explain the growth of europe uh, during the 17th century at the time that we started getting conquered we were conquered 450 years by the europeans first the portuguese then the dutch then the british of people asking why did they come here why did they come why did they have to come here in the first place so max weber wrote a famous uh, thesis during uh, 1905 uh, and uh, it was uh, titled as the protestant ethic and the rise of the spirit of capitalism it's a amazing book in fact uh, people so many economists condemned him because saying though there's be ex- economic explanation to this not a belief uh, so eventually they analyze what were these beliefs that this protestant ethic had during that time and they were they were really habits of hard work really that you look at work as an enabling factor like you breathe like you eat like can you drink that we have to live only by working <laughs> so hard work hard of course doesn't mean physical it means mental as well as physical also anti leisure that's a very strange thing today to say that you don't want to enjoy yourself but uh, looking suspiciously at leisure was a habit uh, which he said that uh, this protestant ethic had an asceticism almost uh, living like a saint morally good uh, but you are not a saint you are a practical person and you are living like that and also he created a new uh, concept called value rationality now we know what rationality is rationality is really uh, reason Uh, the cause and effect type of relationship between something how did this happen so what are the causes that's rational but value rationality he said is a rationality built on a set of values if you value hard work it will lead you to success that's a belief so that kind of rationality he called as value rationality so if you have a set of beliefs that something does good for you it will work for you it will that is how religions also work basically it's all value rationality they have different models of value rationality and if you do that it will work for you okay then somewhere in 1961 the famous david macle and he was a psychologist he tried to understand what kind of uh, psychological inputs went into people who actually were very effective and uh, he came out with one thing that saying that the way parents brought up children child rearing practices which really created something you know a kind of ethic in a person and therefore he that was embedded embedded in a person's psyche also during that time there were heroes very heroes were actually there they were put into stories kids were told those stories and they emulated those heroes so hero stories where heroes are was a very important thing sometimes because emulation you have patterns of behavior patterns of behavior and what did so and so do during that time you emulate it later 
2001, the famous Gerd Hofstede. Gerd Hofstede actually was a Dutch, Dutch psycho, uh, sociologist and he tried to look for specific behaviors uh, that really created uh, finally nation building but character building first and sometimes eventually uh, effectiveness. Uh, and he, uh, he, he studied so many nations and he found particularly these are some things that respect for work, pure respect, a real honest respect for what you do, right? Discipline. Discipline is actually coded behavior, really that goes along with that work. Thrift. Thrift is like efficiency in resources. It may be cash, it may be people and you are very careful about that. In other words, what we today call lean, 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 to be lean, right? In other words, that is use the minimum resources and get the maximum outputs. Also the order of relationships, who should do what, uh, who is uh, the society is stratified in a certain way and therefore uh, what, what you should respect, what you should do, what you should understand was a set of uh, a kind of order of relationships between people, the sociological kind of uh, power, power balance. Uh, also he spoke about the duty to family that ultimately your nest is the family and therefore you need to uh, see where ultimately your resources flow into finally the impact, the net impact is family. Also he spoke about something about ego economic egalitarianism. Now egalitarianism means the power at your particular level to do the things that you really want to do whatever level it is. So he here are some important habitual, we are now zeroing down to habits, really, habits really what we are talking about are sort of uh, persistent behaviors that a person gets. Okay, so this is uh, really three authors who spoke about uh, uh, how uh, some habits and these habits actually that led to nation building. Oh, we are talking about Anagarika Dharmapala as well. Uh, he way back in 1898, of course he is known as a lay preacher, but long before that he was actually the eldest son of Don Carolis Evitarna and he was trained to be a manager first, long time before that he was going to take the business over, being the eldest son of H. Don Carolis who has a famous Don Carolis company, but he eventually had another vision and then he moved out, but the fact is that he he actually being uh, uh, kind of professional, trained to be a professional person, he saw the importance of an ethic and he wrote actually if you have, he wrote a book which is titled Dharampala Lipi, it is uh, published like that, somewhere about the 30th Lipi, 30th, 36th is called Vyapare uh, <laughs> Vye in how a business one should behave. It's amazing actually and some of the writings are very important. In fact, that particular book, the Dharmapal Lipi sold according to this uh, information by 1958 that sold 49,500 copies, okay. Uh, he, he just, I want to focus on a statement that he made which was very important. He says, now you can see his drive here, uh, we purchase pear soap and coconut biscuits manufactured by Huntley and Palmer and sit on chairs made in Australia, drink putrefied liquid known as tint milk manufactured near the South Pole while our own cows are dying for want of fodder and grazing ground and our own pottery we have given up for enamel goods manufactured in distant Austria and our own brass lamps we have melted and are paying to purchase ink lamps which require the supplies of chimneys manufactured in Belgium. Our own weavers are starving and we are purchasing cloth manufactured everywhere. 1898, more than 100 years ago, actually the same drumbeat is still alive, really. So what do we do, what do we do, really speaking? He was trying to exhort a national ethic of trying to do things with your own resources and trying to energize the people in the country on one side. Of course, he was preaching. Uh, religion as well, but on the other side, he had some very good publications really on uh, the ethic of working. It's very interesting. I am going to some local engineers as well, which very familiar to you. 
Revijay Vardhan, of course, very interesting personality. I met him once long time ago when I was doing engineering. We were dabbling with alternate energy, uh, talking about 1980s. So I ran into him and he gave us a lot of ideas and uh, we did something. Uh, he was, as you know, an accomplished engineer, an aviator. He used to fly. I remember that yellow colored helicopter that used to fly right on top. You could see it going like a little bug. Uh, inventor and Olympian. Lea Vijayavadana preferred to introduce himself simply as a farm and mechanic who still got his hands dirty. Always curious, enthusiastic and open-minded. He managed to have his head literally in the clouds and his feet firmly on the ground. It's a kind of way of life. So if you go to analyze and dissect this way of life, you will find there are a series of habits. <coughs> a system of habits actually that created this way of life. So, the habit is the element uh, of configuration of these habits actually creates an ethic and the ethic eventually is very useful in creating a very good strong outcome. Uh, here is a quotation from him. <coughs> I have rarely been able to get one of my learned colleagues to step into the paddy field with me and plow behind the buffalo. Yet, that's where you begin and the process of development by doing it yourself. Thank you. So if you try to analyze it, if we do a research on why he did that and how he did that and we do the full W, 5W and 1H on him, you know, how did he do it, where did he do it, why did he do it, what did he do, all the same, how did he do it. You will find that there are series of habits that actually propelled him to do that along with his knowledge. You can have the knowledge, but if you, how do you get the energy to do that? We have a lot of guys who have a lot of good knowledge. But uh, you sometimes find it very difficult to get them to stand from a chair. Okay, so this, this is a problem. So it's actually, that's why it's important to talk about habits. Talking about famous uh, DJ Vimal, Vimla Surendra. Okay, he, he, his key quality was uh, perseverance. He didn't give up. You know, he had this vision. About 100,000 lights can be lit with the electricity generator by water cascading down, he didn't give that up. During that time, when I read his biography, I saw that he felt there was so much opposition to what he came out. But in spite of that, he went forward, he pushed. And he was not taken seriously, as it says. Five years later, in 1913, he had worked on a building of a small Blackpool powerhouse to supply electricity to Nuralia, using the water from the town's reservoir. He showed that it's possible and today actually we are, it's a reality. Uh, what made him persist? If you ask that question, uh, someone else would have given up, someone else would have... Uh, these are Edison for example, <laughs> about uh, nearly a thousand failures he succeeded. Now what makes people push like that? Uh, if you go to analyze it, it's not simply to say that look, that was his psychology. But it's psychology plus some bodily intelligence that made him do that, really. So what's uh, important here and our topic is habits, is a very important uh, thing to understand. <coughs> okay, so now uh, one person who wrote so much about habits, uh, he dissected habits, was a famous Stephen Covey who wrote his book the seven habits of highly effective people. I am not going to do a uh, talk about that, but I, I thought it was a brilliant uh, system that he envisioned. One thing is that he spoke about, uh, you know, sets sets of uh, skills. He says, if you want to be, in, if you want to be effective, you have to pass through as a person. You have to pass through three phases. The first phase that you need to enter into is dependence, be a good goaler, right? be a good follower, learn from others, right? but move forward, right? one day to be independent. So from dependence to independent. So he prescribed, now his, uh, his research was based on so many, so many uh, people that he had met and done research and he said that there is this clustered set of skills, sorry habits that were so important 
to move from dependence to independence. So it's a set of habits. A set of habits and he called that set a set of private victory. And uh, the three habits he, he understood or prescribed was to be proactive. As you know the difference between proaction and reaction. We are very familiar with reaction because Newton's third law is talking about reaction. Right? Uh, I suppose if Newton uh, thought a little more, he would have said there is a law of proaction as well. Okay. So, <laughs> proaction is to go not equal and opposite, to go beyond that. Right? Or, oh, see, typically to break, the, to break the link between stimulus and response. Someone throws something at you like this, the response is immediate to catch it. Will you let it fall? If you let it fall, that means you are thinking. You think. But if you react, you don't think. So, how can you do that? Really, the whole principle of uh, martial arts is based on proaction, not reaction. So, uh, that's very important. So, how do you do that? So, it has to be a habit. For example, if someone comes to you and uh, maybe uh, you know who this guy is and therefore you react. I don't want to talk to this guy immediately. But if you want, proaction is quite different. Proaction means you break your reaction into an area of thinking. So you take a deep breath, you don't say anything. Now body is required. Take a deep breath, hold your breath. When you hold your breath, immediately that uh, one tenth of a second is enough to reactivate your uh, neocortex. The neocortex is actually the new brain and you can think because this is a later development, the left brain. It's a later development. It takes one tenth of a cent to react, to, 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 to act. So if it goes there, you can look at your choices. What shall I do? Shall I do this or sh shall I do that? So the first habit is actually to break that, to break that uh, immediate response to something and try to say, okay, it doesn't matter to delay, take a little time, you know, and try to take a deep breath, get a little oxygen into your brain. When you take a deep breath, you get oxygen into your brain and then you can think. So this is a habit. Every day, for a few times you have to do it consciously. And after some time, like driving the car, it will take over. It will take over. So this is the first habit actually. The second one he says is to begin with the end in mind. Always think, well you are here now, but what will you be in the future? And where are you going into? And work towards it. So that is begin with the end in mind, okay, always what you do. Supposing you are meeting a customer today, uh, you try to envision uh, at the end of the meeting what is their ideal state. If you can envision that, then you are moving forward to the ideal state. Uh, then the third habit he talks about, I am only going to use this later, I am going to really try to relate it to engineering professionals as we are going on. Uh, having been there also, I could tell you something about that. Uh, is uh, the third one is to talk about first things first that is to how you would how you would uh, allocate your time and your space and your resources actually that's uh, really what you do what should come first so uh, what Stephen Covey said was uh, here is a nested set of uh, uh, nested set of uh, behaviors or habits which will take you over a period of time, not immediately, over a period of time into a state of independence where you become actually a master of yourself, a master of yourself. Uh, now he is talking about another, he talk about effectiveness, we can never reach effectiveness, he says, without the help of others. We are very often people actually will intervene and if you want to do something, you need the help of others as well. So this move from independence to interdependence requires according to him another nested set of habits and those habits actually he refers to as public victory he calls that he labels that as public victory uh, the fourth habit is try to win-win that is you want something but someone else also the other people who are working with you or they want to return on that they also want some part of it so how you can in how you can build that into this some way or the other then he is next talking about seek first to understand. If you want people to understand you, he says that you have to first understand them. Sorry. You have to understand them first. When you understand them, you could relate to their frame of reference. 
now you you know if you want to explain Newton, uh, say Einstein's theory of relativity to a class of uh, graduates there is no problem because they have the framework to understand that but can you give a lecture I would not a lecture sometimes uh, uh, the understanding to a set of Montessori students about Einstein's theory of relativity you can if you use the right models use building blocks or whatever uh, in their frame of reference how they understand it and you get the principle relativity okay so <laughs> something moves against each other and what you cross and things like that you can you can scratch that you know so what he is saying is that therefore when we are talking to others they don't hardly, they don't understand us 100% so if we understand them we can we can target their frame of reference and therefore they will understand that's very difficult because everyone has a different frame of reference right so you can't generally talk you have to build confidence with people you have to address the not a general frame of reference but a specific frame of reference if you want people to understand so this whole idea about uh, doing that finally he is talking about synergy this is a very thermodynamic principle seriously we are familiar with entropy you know what ent entropy is it's a loss of energy into a system say when you work with two people and you don't like the guy you can't work as much as you can work your work goes down energy lost into the system say for example those of you who go to a gym you go to a gym you can lift I can lift maybe about 50 I don't know but I can lift about 50 kg right and maybe uh, Arjuna can lift 60 kg so that means according to theory we should be able to lift 110 kg but if I like Arjuna I think I like him we will lift about 120 seriously because some energy trapped in our system is released the reverse of entropy is synergy is negentropy actually it's the other side of it really uh, you you can also pump out energy from your system because we don't use all the energy in our system you, you have to be really provoked to take a little more energy so this idea about synergy is a very thermodynamic principle it's the reverse of entropy right yeah, we generally have when you work together there is a lot of chaos and energy lost in the system so even if you have a meeting for example uh, it doesn't develop to the level of your thinking so if you want to develop that we have to create some kind of situation where all the energy which is trapped in people's minds may be creativity may be ideas outflow so then you say that yeah the, the formula is 1 plus 1 plus energy equals 3 ok so you really have to add a plus 1 plus energy because that's the lost energy in the system now this is a very nice framework ah he talks about 7th habit down there it's a pipe like thing and it just flows the whole idea is that we have to continuously renovate these things even if you have gone up there and you are inter interdependent from time to time you have to revisit the old habits and then give a little more energy to that doing things like that so therefore this is the seventh habit is he uses the word sharpening the saw a uh, very interesting thing because uh, carpenters always before they start some work they sharpen the saw they sharpen the saw right so uh, the whole idea is before you do something uh, and you are trying to do something just revisit your early habits and then go forward do something from time to time in those areas now this is the frame of reference that I am going to use to try to uh, try to talk about engineers professional engineers what does this mean to us taking this generic this very generic type of structure ok let me try and let's go we of course we can talk a little more when we are discussing this <coughs> so there are seven essential habits based on this which uh, I have put into seven actually there may be more than it but probably uh, clustered into that how do you do this you have to try it out you have to try it out from time to time find a space in your existing routine some place some time some space to practice this where each micro habit these are all seven micro habits that will create effectiveness can be practiced try it at home try it at home right when the spouse is talking be quiet and listen <laughs> okay try it very difficult 
right? When you try that, you are kind of a yoga, right? Let it go. Take a couple of deep breaths and listen, right? So like that, you can try. It. Try it with your kids. Try it with someone who actually work with one of your co-workers, uh, one of your uh, peers. Uh, these are areas to try these out. Also keep the behavior simple. Don't try to do elaborate things, but just try to do one thing, like listening, for example. Listening, okay. Uh, thinking before answering. Ask him, ask the people for a little time. Let me think. Doesn't matter. No problem, right? Try to do that, and make it a part of your routine. Over a period of time, like drinking the glass of water, 600 milliliters every day, your body will take it. Your body will take you to do that. Your car, your body. There is body intelligence. The intelligence has gone into your hands, the feet and everything like that is reacting. Right? It will happen. Also, here are three habits like before for private victory. Three habits for public victory which is actually for interdependence and one habit for re-energizing. So these are the things I am going to talk about and uh, might uh, just give you uh, say for example some food for thought right? I would say. Okay, here is the first habit. How do you proact? Now, a particularly this is very useful at the beginning of a person's career. Uh, particularly, I think all of us can remember the first time we started uh, working as engineers. Okay, how this was? We had bosses actually. Bosses are sometimes very good to work with. We learned a lot from them. We learned stories of the past and things like that. Uh, one practice I can remember when I was working with uh, senior designs, mechanical designs, and he used to get me to keep a learning diary. What did I do today? Uh, what did I see? Things like that. And I used to discuss that. He had no time every time to discuss, but I had a few things uh, to discuss when I had the time with him. So, say maybe a Friday morning or something like that, uh, specific time, all these things I have already jotted down, I can bounce it off. Suddenly his uh, mind is live and then uh, it's moving. So, the whole idea is that we should get ideas, uh, flow of ideas. Uh, a lean startup of career. Lean means actually being very efficient. The word efficient is now given a bigger connotation in our engineering language and we talk about lean. Lean actually means lack of waste, elimination of waste. So there are various forms of waste. So we will talk about that. Uh, so every opportunity, every event has an opportunity to proact. We can think a little different from what we thought before uh, and the model for that is this uh, typical uh, cycle uh, you get an idea uh, then you build something you uh, turn it into a product or a service maybe and you have an outcome of a product get it to work get it to work and observe measure and then you have data from that uh, you observe and measure and then you keep improving, you can improve it, you learn from that and then your idea is bigger, your idea is bigger. So this is entirely the learning cycle and generally this is normally called, referred to as single loop type of learning. But when you come to this point uh, and you have got some data and you feel that there is another thing that you can do with this, right? You can loop, you can actually pivot, normally that is referred to as pivoting, move out of that and get into another thing. So this entire process of going forward is uh, very iterative and also iterative and escaping. So sometimes, now you give example why I put this post-it is an example really. Uh, you know what post is, we see it everywhere but you know I think how this came about as well. It was a mistake. This company 3M made a glue that didn't dry. Now that is not now a normal practice. We, d we shouldn't have glues that don't dry. So if you ask why not and you pivot, what can I do with this? Immediately what really happened as you know was uh, they, they have a culture of uh, innovation in 3M that uh, l mistakes are major areas of learning. So and they bring it forward. No one hides a mistake. So when you make a mistake, the culture is that you come and explain how you make the mistake and it's learning. So the second part of that is to say, okay, what do we do with it? So, so immediately one person from the group says, okay, he's a member of a learning, uh, learning, uh, singing group. 
and uh, he, he says, look, the guy who plays the piano is always right, want to write notes and stick can remove it. So he said, okay. So they say, okay, go and give it to him and see whether he likes it. So he goes and says he likes it. Now, this is not a, so how many piano, pianists do you get? So then they send it again. The second pivoting is to see whether secretaries like it in the office. Would they like to do something like this? So they said, yeah, this is fine. We don't have to write on the document. We can write it, take it off. So you know, this is the history of the post-it. All of the world, one of the most successful products 3M ever had is by a series of pivoting. So the whole idea is, uh, when we see when we see anything, uh, and it doesn't fall into our normal uh, normal conventional thinking of something, look for okay, what next? So this whole even if it is a career or you're doing your work or you're doing a design or whatever, you get opportunities for pivoting, and therefore this is actually a continuous uh, process of learning. So we normally refer to that one of the important habits, especially if. We are inculcating in very young people who are first learning, uh, getting into the field to always look at things and say, why not? What else? Things like that. Okay, so that's the first habit uh, on the lines of proaction that we spoke about. The second habit is actually to envision into four spaces. <coughs> Kavi spoke about begin with the end in mind. So where do you begin? Here. I think you should begin in country. One day you want to do something for your country. I think that's a place, good place to envision. One day, maybe not now, but one day you are, before you leave this earth, if you envision doing something for the country, that is where everything starts. Then you talk about workplace. I had something, you know, I passed through about three or four workplaces. And uh, something I promise myself is that when I leave this workplace, I leave behind something that people remember. Seriously, right? So I, I did that. In fact, there are some things I went through about five organizations, and I left behind something that which everyone talks. Now when I meet them, I am not no more in those organizations, but they remember that. So you have left behind something. You have to account for the space you occupy. There are four spaces we occupy. These are the four spaces, country, workplace, family and me. There was a time I was a general manager in a Japanese company here. And I was working with the Japanese, so the two the Japanese were reporting to me as well. Right? And uh, something they say that they have a mantra, kind of thing, what you call a mantra. And it's in Japanese. They call it Kuni, Kaisha, Kazuku and Boku. Last word is Boku. Right? Myself. <laughs> Kuni means country. Kaisha is an uh, organization, Kazuku is family and Boku, myself. We have to have visions for all these four things. Uh, but you should not start with Boku first. Right? You must always start with the end in mind. The final end is country and then you zero down a little bit to workplace, then family and me. So that is actually, it will uh, it will propel, propel you forward. And if we actually believe in futures, future is never here now, but it's in our mind. So we can create something in our mind for this. And that's what's really important. So uh, these are also, as you ask architects or even designers, they will always say all things are created thrice in the mind. First, of course, they see the picture in their mind. Second, they will draw it on a two-dimensional sketch, third thing will really do it. So there are three levels of creation actually. First in the mind, then on paper, then in the in reality. So in all these spaces, you first create in your mind, then you start making a plan on paper, <coughs> and then you slowly go towards that. <coughs> because one drives the other. The larger idea is the impact area. If you start with the impact, then other thing will automatically happen because the entire work, the world will look like a, a script and then you are part of the script and you find it. So this is the whole idea about uh, the second habit. The third habit is uh, using uh, three very common words that are used now, uh, lean and agile. These are concepts. Uh, lean naturally really means lack of waste, elimination of waste, waste 
can be so many places as we are talking about. Uh, le uh, agile means uh, fast uh, and quickly responding to situations. Uh, the very important thing I have said here, don't work on cycle time but work on tech time. Now cycle time, now if we have a process, we know you are running processes, depending on the process you have a cycle time. But the customer outside there wants it faster. Now, if you want, that is tech time. That's called tech, it's a German term, you know, actually tech time is a German term for demand time, uh, demand cycle time. So that means that your cycle time, you can't, with the present process, you can't do it. So what happens now? You will innovate. You will innovate and reduce waste. You will do all those things and try to match the demand time. Now when you do that, there is no waste, right? You are agile as well and then you are, you are working on that, nothing is left over. Uh, you have zero inventory sometimes when you do that. So these are ideas that can be done. Now for example, uh, we don't work at our own time. We, we actually have to work on demand time. Whatever the demand time is, if we can move it in, then we have, we, what the important thing about that is that you will have to change the process. You will change the process, you will do it in such a way that you give the demand. You move towards it gradually. You can't do it in one shot. Then if you talk about lean, here are seven wasteful personal habits. Uh, inventory of unnecessary tasks. Among the things you have to do for a day, for example, look at the things and see what is actually I don't have to do some things, some things I have to do. So therefore you don't have an inventory of unnecessary tasks, even in life. Right? So you can over planning, wasting time doing more than what's requ required. Right? Waiting and procrastinating. I am waiting for someone to do something. Procrastinating uh, will put you off for tomorrow. Uh, overwork and workaholism. You know, overwork. Uh, then we are talking about overdoing and inde indecisiveness. Overdoing. Uh, not necessarily, you are not stopping, you are going on. Also, you are taking unnecessary trips and travel. Movement. Waste of movement. Also, repeating the same mistake. 3-4 times. Very good to mis find mistakes. When you have the mistake, you, you have to pivot. You must learn from that and pivot. But if you keep repeating the same mistake, it's a waste. So this is uh, the third habit. We're moving on to the fourth habit is uh, really, you know, we are moving into the area of uh, area of working with others. Because we can never be effective unless we can gear the others also into our system. This is a thing that came out of my PhD research long time ago. One of the outcomes is that any system that we work in is a socio-technical system. There is a very good process whatever is in, but you get also a society, a group of a, a community that is surrounding this. And the, the characteristics of the community is quite different to the characteristics of the logical system that we work with. Here you have culture which is actually not really rational. It is a irrational thing. It's a kind of a value-based rationality. Whereas the processing systems are rational. They have been designed on technical. So if you can split this and see really when you are working with others, uh, how would you fit people into a technical system? How would you fit people into a social system? What I really uh, look at when I look at this is really ultimately we want to get commitment, not motivation, commitment. That is people say, okay, I will do it. I am willingly doing it. So you have to look at two sides. If you look at the technical system, then you match the jobs people do with their techni technical capability. Then you have the job fit. And that leads to job involvement and job satisfaction. On the other side, you look at the culture of the organization and the value systems of the people. That's very important. And therefore, you try to integrate that. So you have to sometimes design your culture. And organizations are very good places where you can experiment with culture. You keep moving certain practices and things like that where people actually will fit in culturally and therefore you have the outcome of that is people identify with the organization. They say this is me. Now we have been in schools, we identify with schools. Till you die you will say you belong to a certain school but will you say that for the organizations? Very rarely. Whether you will really say I belong to this organization like you belong to a school. That is because schools have a culture. They have traditions and you actually that same environment 
has to be inculcated. People look actually when they look at organizations, they look at inorganic systems, whereas they are organic systems. So what you really get ultimately from this, if you want high performance, is total commitment, high organizational identification, high job sat uh, satisfaction, then you have total commitment. If it's low but high here, you might be committed to the organization only. Or if it's low here and high here, you may be committed to a job and then you do the same job in another organization, it doesn't matter. Most of our professionals are really committed mostly to a job, not to the organization. But actually if you want to really get performance, you have to have both. This is what I found when I did my research uh, a long time ago. Okay, now we are talking about the fifth habit is about empathy. Really we want to listen, think, feel because we are we are thinking, feeling people, really speaking. Now I can ask you when you are seated on the chair, what are you thinking? I could ask you what are you feeling also? Are you feeling comfortable? Are you feeling warm, cold, or whatever? That's feeling. Right? Are you feeling uh, nice? No. At the same time, I can talk about logic. Uh, what's the structure of your mind? What are you thinking of? Now the whole uh, system here is actually what we talk about as emotional intelligence. That is the intelligence about emotions. That's what it's about. It's a very strong habit actually to build this. Uh, on one side, we are talking about how you start. Is you are actually looking at self-awareness about yourself. You have a good idea about yourself. Then from there you could move uh, to a social competency where awareness of others. Because you have a reference point now. If you are you think about other people relative to yourself, if you know who you are. That is, you have a reference point, clear reference point. If you don't have a reference point, it's very difficult to think about uh, others and understand others as well. So you could go there. You could also go here. If you have self-awareness, you can manage yourself. If you really know how you are, what kind of a person you are, uh, and be honest, everyone is honest about themselves, I think that's very good, yeah, ultimately. And finally, uh, with the awareness of others, and your own self-management, you can manage relations, relationships. That's very important. So I think where it starts off with, with self, who I am and what I do, then finally, who I am and really, how do I really are aware of others. So the outcomes of those are what's are shown here, that you can be empowered, you can be resilient. Resilient means, uh, you know what resilience is, that's a very strength of materials type of word. Uh, when you take off the load, it comes back to the same point. So that is resilience. Under stress, you take stress. But when the stress is taken off, when the force is taken off, you don't have residual stress. You just come back to the same point. That is what is called resilience. Sri Lankans are supposed to be resilient. I was amazed to hear about that. Because really speaking, there are so many things about Sri Lanka, like you are talking about per capita income, you are talking about quality of life. Now there are some new indexes in uh, the UN. Talk about resilience, you are talking about quality of life, kind of happiness, gross national happiness, things like that. <laughs> Sri Lanka is actually way, way high on those things, on those happiness and things like that. I don't know why. I, don't. I think we are happy guys, okay. So uh, I think we, that's a strength. Okay. So I think that's the fifth habit. Uh, here is a sixth habit which I am showing with a clip. Uh, the whole idea is innovation. Everyone thinks that you have to, there is a big difference as you know between invention and innovation. Invention is scientific outcome. Innovation is bringing it to the market, commercial outcome using a scientific in, in invention. So uh, the, it is a social thing that really innovates. For example, if you study companies like Honda and uh, uh, 3M for that matter, they from the beginning of the design to the end of the car, it's a team that does it. And in that team you get a mix of people, not only the engineers, but you also get the marketing guys, you get the finance guys in this team from the beginning to the end. So that's amazing because what happens at the end of it, you get a synergy that comes. We talk about synergy. Okay, this uh, little clip will actually tell you what this is about. Uh, it's actually a very graphical type of clip. For the past five years, I've been investigating this question of where good ideas come from. It's a kind of problem I think all of us are intrinsically interested in. We want to be more creative. We want to come up with better ideas. We want our organizations to be more innovative. I've looked at this problem from an environmental perspective. What are the spaces 
that have historically led to unusual rates of creativity and innovation. What I've found in all of these systems, there are these recurring patterns that you see again and again that are crucial to creating environments that are unusually innovative. One pattern I call the slow hunch, that breakthrough ideas almost never come in a moment of great insight and a sudden stroke of inspiration. Most important ideas take a long time to evolve, and they spend a long time dormant in the background. It isn't until the idea has had two or three years, sometimes 10 or 20 years, to ensure that it suddenly becomes successful to you and useful to you in a certain way. And this is partially because good ideas normally come from the collision between smaller hunches so that they form something bigger than themselves. So you see a lot in the industry of innovation cases of, of someone who has half of them. There's a great story about the invention of the World Wide Web in Berners Lee. This is a project that Berners Lee worked on for 10 years. But when we started, we didn't have a full vision of this new medium we were going to invent. He started working on one project as a side project to help him organize his own data. He scrapped that after a couple of years, and he started working on another thing. And only after about 10 years of full vision of the World Wide Web coming to be in. That is, more often than not, how ideas happen. They need time to incubate. And they spend a lot of time in this partial hunch form. The other thing that's important when you think about ideas this way is that when ideas take form in this hunch state, they need to collide with other hunches. Oftentimes, the thing that turns a hunch into a real breakthrough is another hunch that's lurking in somebody else's mind. And you have to figure out a way to create systems that allow those hunches to come together and turn into something bigger than some of their parts. That's why, for instance, the coffee house in the age of the Enlightenment, or the Parisian salons of the moderns, were such engines for creativity because they created a space where ideas could mingle and swap and create forms. When you look at the problem of innovation from this perspective, it sheds a lot of important light on the debate we've been having recently about what the internet is doing to our brains. Are we getting overwhelmed with an always connected, multicasting lifestyle? And is that going to lead to less sophisticated thoughts as we move away from the slower, deeper, contemplative state of reading? For instance, obviously, I'm a big fan of reading. But I think it's important to remember that the great driver of scientific innovation and technological innovation has been the historic increase in connectivity and our ability to reach out and exchange ideas with other people and to borrow other people's hunches and combine them with our hunches and turn them into something new. That really has, I think, been, more than anything else, the primary engine of creativity and innovation for the last 600 or 700 years. And so yes, it's true we're more distracted. But what has happened that is really miraculous and marvelous over the last 15 years is that we have so many new ways to connect and so many new ways to reach out and find other people who have that missing piece that will complete the idea we're working on, or to stumble serendipitously across some amazing new piece of information use to build and improve our own ideas. That's the real lesson of where good ideas come from. The chance favors the next mind. Okay. So that's a very important thing to understand. Design and innovation might be better actually by seeking ideas of others as well. Particularly not only in the field of engineering, if you are doing engineering, probably bring other people in. This is a, has been a trend I can remember. I can remember once I just hopped into a supermarket in uh, London, Tesco. And I was, first time I went in there. And suddenly they asked me whether I could come for a meeting. And I am a first person here. And I, when I went there, it's the, it's a, it, it's a organization. And I have just invited as a customer to be in their meeting to decide on something, you know. So the perception, my first perception is very important for them, right. And uh, they got that, and then that helped them to design something. I don't know, but I ended up with the meeting. I never went there after that. I went somewhere else, but I think they got something from my mind, and that's that probably would have gone in. So we have these half ideas, caught ideas, little bits of ideas. So the whole idea comes into comes into life when you connect up, and that's the whole story about this synergy. So when we talk about synergy in our area of work. We are talking about design, we are talking about innovation, we are talking about systems, things like that. Okay, the last slide that I have is really the last habit. Uh, how do you really renew this entire set of habits? 
You might forget habits, you can undo habits. Like you gain habits over a period of time, you can lose them. So what, uh, again we are adapting this, I am adapting this from a famous book that was written called The Corporate Athlete. The Corporate Athlete was written by Loa and Schwartz. They were actually earlier Olympic uh, trainers. They were trained, they trained Olympic uh, stars. So the Olympic stars had physical power. They had physical power. Uh, they had physical power, but probably they had to get something more to have that edge to win gold medals and things like that. And the other edge was the mental power, maybe the mental power. And there are these four spaces, all our energy, see our energy basically you'll be, I mean we all know, comes from food, from chemical energy. Basically we digest food and our body works and our brain works. But really speaking, there are four sources, there are four sources where we can get energy from. One is physical. Physical definitely is from being fit, uh, eating the right uh, food and things like that. It's very important to look after your body. Right? Second area is social. We can get energy from others. Uh, that is the real synergy, what we call synergy. We can get energy from others. The second thing is mental. That is we can energize our mind uh, to do certain things. So our mind itself will move into this. Uh, uh, that's another source of energy. And finally spiritual, now spiritual, the word spiritual does not mean religion, all religions have uh, models of spirituality, but spirituality means actually to see a higher purpose in what you are doing, that's just that, whatever you are doing, now like that guy who was uh, once uh, uh, building a cathedral or something, the one guy had gone and asked him, okay, he is a bricklayer, uh, so uh, one bricklayer says, okay, I am laying bricks, that's my job, the other guy says, I am building a cathedral. So his, uh, his idea about his big playing is bigger. So whatever you do, if you have a bigger purpose of whatever you do, why you are doing it, that is spiritual because it will give you energy, really speaking. So these are the four. Now what uh, the, uh, the idea is to have rituals, rituals are habits, so that you can from time to time pump this energy. I'll give you a small example. Uh, getting up and doing a walk in the morning or having very light weights and just swinging it occasionally in the morning will give you physical energy. Being aware of what you eat for example is looking after your body. You get energy from that. Socialists move with the right guys. If you move with really innovative people, you will be innovative. right? If you move with naysayers, the guys who always say, no, no, you can't do that. Uh, you will also turn out to be like that. So you go into entropy then. right? Entropy, loss of energy into the system. right? Whereas uh, then mental is actually challenge yourself always, learn something new, look a new skill, stretch your mind a little bit on something and finally spiritual have a bigger purpose in life. So that's uh, my presentation. Thank you very much and uh, I hope it, I hope it gives some ideas. Don't go away because the fun starts now. Uh, we get a chance to uh, uh, interact with uh, Dr. Travis. Uh, those of you on online uh, looking at watching, uh, who has been watching us, uh, stay there because there will be another slide. Shall I hit the button? Uh, we are live streaming the discussion as well today through a different technology.